Hello, everyone. Welcome to theCUBE's coverage of International Women's Day. I'm your host, John Furrier, here in Palo Alto, California studio, and remoting as a great guest, CUBE alumni, co-founder, technical co-founder, and she's also the VP of product at Platform 9 Systems. It's a company pioneering Kubernetes infrastructure, been doing it for a long, long time. Met her, Miskatsky, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Appreciate you, Nora, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. Always exciting. So I always, I love interviewing you for many reasons. One, you're super smart, but also you're a co-founder, technical co-founder, so entrepreneur, uh, VP of product. It's hard to do startups, <laughs> okay? So, you know, everyone uh, who started a company knows how hard it is. And it, it really is, and the rewarding too, when you're successful. So I want to get your thoughts on what's it like being an entrepreneur, uh, women in tech, some things you've done along the way. Let's get started. How did you, get into your career in tech and what made you want to start a company? Yeah, so you know, I got into tech long, long before um, I decided to start a company. And back when I got in tech, I was, it was, it was very clear to me um, as a direction for my career that I'm never going to start a business. Um, I was very explicit about that because my father was an entrepreneur um, and I'd seen how rough the journey can be. Uh, and then my brother was also, is an entrepreneur. And I think with both of them, I'd seen the ups and downs and I had decided to myself and shared with my family that I really want a very well-structured um, sort of job at a large company type of path for my career. Um, I think the tech path, you know, tech was interesting to me, um, not because I was interested in programming, et cetera, at that time. To be honest, when I picked computer science as a major for myself, it was because um, most of uh, most of what you would consider, I guess, um, most of the cool students were picking that as a major. Let's just say that. And it sounded very interesting and cool. A lot of people were doing it, and that was sort of the top top choice uh, for people and I decided to follow along. Um, but I did discover after I picked computer science as as my major and I when I, I remember when I started learning C++, the first time when I got exposure to it, it was just like a light bulb clicking in my head. I just absolutely loved the language, you know, the lower level nature, the power of it and what you can do with it, the algorithms. So I think it ended up being um, a really good fit for me. Yeah, so it clicked for you, you, got, you tried it, it was all yeah. the cool kids were doing it, you know? I mean, I could have related, I did the same thing. Next big yeah. thing is computer science. You gotta be in there, gotta be smart. And then you get yeah. hooked on it. What's yeah, exactly. The, what was the next level? Did you find any blockers in your way? Obviously male dominated, it must've been a lot of, uh, how many females were in your class? What was the ratio at that time? Yeah, so the ratio was, um, you know, pretty, pretty, um, I, I would say, uh, bleak when it comes to women to men. I think computer science at that time was still probably better compared to some of the other majors like uh, mechanical engineering, where I remember I had one friend. Uh, she was the single girl in an entire class of about at least 120, 130 students or so. Um, so the ratio was better for us. I think there were maybe uh, 20, 25 girls in our class. It was a large class uh, and maybe the uh, number of men were maybe 3x or 4x number of women, so um, relatively better, yeah. How about the job when you get when you got into the structured big company? How'd that go? Yeah, so, you know, I think I think that that was um, that was a pretty smooth path, I would say, you know, after, you know, you graduate from undergrad to grad school. Um, and then when I got into Oracle first and, and VMware, I think both companies had the ratios were still, you know, pretty off. Uh, and I think they still are to a very large extent in this industry. But I think this industry, in my experience, does a fantastic job of uh you know, bringing everybody and kind of embracing them and treating them at the same level. That was definitely my experience. And so that makes it very easy for self-confidence, for uh, setting up a path for yourself to thrive. So that was easy. Okay, so you got an undergraduate degree, okay, in computer science and a master's from Stanford in mm -hmm. databases and distributed systems. That's right. Okay, so dual, dual degrees. Did that come, was that part of your pathway or you just decided, I want to go right into school. Did, did it go right, right after each other? How did that work out? Yeah. So when I went into school, undergrad, there was no special major, uh, and I didn't quite know if I liked a particular subject or set of subjects or not. Uh, even through grad school, first year, it wasn't clear to me. But I think in second year, I did start realizing that in general, I was a fan of backend systems. I was never a front-end person. Uh, the backend distributed systems really um, 
were of interest to me because there's a lot of complex problems to solve and especially databases and large scale uh, distributed systems design in the context of database systems, um, you know, really started becoming uh, a topic of interest for me. And I think um, luckily enough at Stanford, there were just fantastic professors uh, like Mendel Rosenblum, who offered operating system class there, then, you know, started VMware. And later on, I was able to join the company. Um, and I took his class while at school, and it was one of the most fantastic classes I've ever taken. So they really had, and probably I think still do, a fantastic curriculum when it comes to distributed systems. And I think that probably helped stoke that interest. How, how do you talk to the younger um, girls out there in elementary school and through, what's the, what's the advice as they start to get into computer science, which is changing and, and still evolving? There's back end, there's front end, there's AI, there's science, data science, there's no code, low code, there's <laughs> cloud. What's your yeah. uh, advice when, when they say, what's the playbook? Yeah, so I think two things I always say, um, and I say I share this with anybody who is looking to get into computer science or engineering for that matter, right? I think one is that it, it's, uh, you know, it, it's important to not worry about what that end specialization is going to be, whether it's AI or databases or back in or front end, it does naturally evolve and you lend yourself to a path where you will understand which, which you know, which systems, which aspects you like better. But it's very critical to start with getting the fundamentals well, right? Meaning all of the key coursework around algorithm, systems design, architecture, networking, operating system. I think it is just so crucial to understand those well, even though at times you may question why Why is this, is this ever going to be relevant and useful to me later on in my career? It really does end up helping in ways beyond, you know, you can describe. It makes you a much better engineer. So I think that is the most important aspect of, uh, you know, I, I would think any engineering stream, but definitely true for, for computer science, because there's also been a trend more recently, I think, which I'm not a big fan of, of um, sort of limited scoped learning, which is uh, you decide early on that you're going to be, uh, let's say, a front end engineer, which is fine, you know, that, you know, understanding that is great. But if you, I don't think it's ideal to let that limit the scope of your learning when you're in undergrad phrase or, or grad school, but la because later on it comes back to sort of bite you in terms of you not being able to completely understand how the systems work. It's a systems kind of thinking. You got to have that mindset of, especially now with cloud, you got distributed systems paradigm going yeah. to the edge. You got 5G, Mobile World Congress just recently happened. You got now all kinds of IOT devices out there, IP of devices at the edge. Distributed computing is only getting more distributed. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. But the other thing is also happens that continues to happen in computer science is that the abstraction layers keep raising things up and up and up. Where even if you're operating at a language like Java, which you know during you know some of my times of programming, at there was a period when it was popular, it already abstracts you so far away from the underlying system. So it can become very easier if you're doing you know JavaScript or UI programming that you really have no understanding of what's, what's happening behind the scenes. And I think that can be pretty yeah, difficult. Yeah, it's easy to get. It's easy. To to lean in and rely too heavily on the abstractions. I want to get your thoughts on blockers. In your career, um, have you had situations where, you know, it's like, oh, you're you're a woman, okay, you know, seat at the table, sit on the side, or maybe people misunderstood your role. How did you deal with that? Did you have any of that? Yeah. So you know, I think so. Is this something? really kind of personal to me, which I uh, like to share a few times, which I think I believe in pretty strongly. And which is for me, my sort of my, 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 my personal growth began at a very early phase uh, because my dad, um, and he passed away in 2012, but throughout the time when I was growing up, I was his special little girl and every little thing that I did could be a simple test. It's, you know, not, you know, not very meaningful, but the genuine pride and pleasure that he felt out of me getting great scores in those tests or et cetera, and that I could see that in him. And then I wanted to please him. And through him, I think I, I built that confidence in myself that I am good at things and I can do good. And I think that just set the building blocks for me for the rest of my life, right? So my, I believe very strongly that, um, it, you know, the, the yes, there is there there are occasions of unfair treatment and et cetera, but it 
And for the most part, it comes from within. And if you are able to be a confident person who is kind of leveled and understands and believes in your capabilities, then for the most part, uh, the right things happen around you. So I, I, I believe very strongly in that kind of grounding and in finding a source to get that uh, for yourself. And I, I think that many women suffer from the biggest challenge, which is not having enough self-confidence. And I've, I've even, uh, you know, with everything that I said, I've myself felt that, experienced that a few times. And then there's a methodical way to get around it. There's processes to, you know, uh, explain to yourself that that's actually not true. That's a fake feeling. So, you know, I think that is the most important aspect for women. I love that. Get the confidence, find the source for the confidence. We're also been hearing about curiosity and building. You mentioned engineering earlier. Love that term, engineering something, like a building something. Curiosity, engineering, confidence. Um, this brings me to my next question for you. What do you think the key skills and qualities are needed to succeed in a technical role? And how do you develop to maintain those skills over time? Yeah, so I think that it is so critical that you love that technology that you are part of. It is just so important. I mean, I remember as an example, at one point with one of my buddies, before we started Platform 9, uh, one of my buddies, um, he's also a fantastic computer scientist from VMware, and he loves video games. And so he said, hey, why don't we try to, you know, hack up a video game and see if we can take it somewhere. And so I, it sounded cool to me. And then so we started doing things. Uh, but, you know, something I realized very quickly is that I, as a person, I absolutely hate video games. I've never <laughs> like them. I don't think that's ever going to change. And so I was miserable. I was, you know, I was trying to understand what's going on, how to build these systems, but I was not enjoying it. So it was, I'm, I'm glad that I decided to not pursue that. So it is just so important that you enjoy whatever aspect of technology that you as decide to associate yourself with. I think that takes away 80, 90% of the work. Um, and then I think it's it's important to inculcate a level of discipline that you are not going to get sort of, uh, you're not going to get uh, jaded or you're, you're going to continue with a happy path where you're do, doing the same things over and over again, but you're not necessarily um, challenging yourself or pushing yourself or putting yourself in uncomfortable situation. I think a combination of those typically, I think, works pretty well in, in, in any technical career. That's a great advice there. I think trying things when you're younger or even just for play to understand whether you abandon that path is just as important as finding the, a good path because at least you know that skews the value in favor of the choices. Um, kind of like I'm kind of kind of like math probability. So great, great, great call out there. So I have to ask you the next question, which is how do you keep up to date given all the changes, you're in the middle of a world where you've seen personal change in the past 10 years from OpenStack to now. Remember those days when I first interviewed you at OpenStack, I think it was 2012 or something like that, maybe yeah. 10 years ago. So much change, how do you keep up with um, technologies in your field and resources that you rely on for personal development? Yeah, so I think when it comes to the you know the the field and what we're doing, for example, I think one of the most important aspects, and I you know I am product manager, and I this is something I insist that all the other product managers in our team also do, uh, is that you have to spend fifty percent of your time talking to prospects, customers, um, leads, uh, and, and 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 through those conversations, they do a huge favor to you in that they make you aware of the other things that they're keeping an eye on, as long as you're doing the right job of asking the right questions and not just you know listening in. So I think that to me ends up being one of the biggest sources uh, where you get tidbits of you know information, new things, et cetera, and then you pursue. Um, to me, that has worked to be a, a very effective source. And then the second is you know reading and keeping up with all of the publications you guys you know, create a lot of great material, you interview a lot of people, making sure you're watching those. For us, you know, CNCF, there's a ton of activities, new projects keeps coming along, you know, every few months. So keeping up with that, listening to podcasts around those topics, all of that helps. But I think the first one, I think, goes in a big way in terms of being aware of what matters to your customers. Awesome. Let me ask you a question. What's the most rewarding aspect of your job right now? Um, so I think, I think there are many. So I think I love, I've come to realize that I love the, you know, the, 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 the high that you get out of being an entrepreneur independent of, you know, there's in terms of success and failure, there's always ups and downs as an entrepreneur, right? But there is, there is this, 
there is uh, there's something really alluring about being able to you know define uh, you know path of your products and in in a way that can potentially impact uh, you know a number of companies that will consume your products, uh, employees that work with you. So that is, I think, to me, always been the most satisfying path and is what kept me um, going. Um, I think that is probably first and foremost. And then uh, the projects, you know, there's always new exciting things that we're working on. Even just today, there are certain projects we're working on that I'm super excited about. So I think it's those two things. So now we didn't get into how you started. You said you didn't want to do a startup and you got the big company, your dad, your brother were entrepreneurs. How did you get into it? Yeah, so you know, it, it's, it's very, it was kind of surprising to me as well, but I think I reached a point of young where after spending about eight years or so where I definitely packed hold. Um, and I could have pushed myself by switching to a completely different company or a different organization within VMware. And I was trying all of those paths, um, you know, interviewed at different companies, et cetera, but nothing felt different enough. Um, and then I, I think I was very, very fortunate in that my co-founders, uh, Shirish Raghuram, Rupak Parikh, uh, you know, Bik, you've met them. Uh, they were kind of all at the same journey in their careers independently at the same time. And, and so we would all eat lunch together at VMware because we were in the same team. And then we just started brainstorming on different ideas during lunchtime. And that's that's kind of how, um, and we did that almost for a year. So by the time that the year long period went by, at the end it felt like the most logical, natural next step to leave our job and to, uh, you know, to start off um, something together. Um, but I think I wouldn't have done that had it been had it not been for my co-founder. So you had comfort with the team, as knew each other at VMware, but you were kind of a little early. <laughs> You had a vision. Um, it's kind of playing out now. How do you feel right now as a, as a, as, a, as the wave is hitting? Distributed computing, microservices, Kubernetes. I mean, stuff you guys did and were doing. I mean, it didn't play out exactly, but directionally, you were right on the line there. How do you feel? Yeah, you know, I think that's that's kind of the. The, the 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 challenge and the fun part with a startup journey, right? Which is you you can't you can never you know predict how things are gonna go. When we kicked off, we thought that OpenStack is gonna really take over infrastructure management space, and things kind of went differently. But things are going that way now with Kubernetes and distributed infrastructure. And so um, I think it's been interesting. And in every path that you take that does end up not being successful, teaches you so much more, right? Uh, so um, I think it's been a very interesting journey. Yeah, I, mean, I think the cloud, certainly AWS hit that growth, right at 2013 through 17, kind of sucked all the oxygen out. But now as, as it reverts back, this abstraction layer essentially makes things look like private clouds, but they're just essentially DevOps. It's cloud operations, kind of the yeah. same thing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and then with the edge, things are becoming way more distributed where having a single large cloud provider is becoming even less relevant in that space and having kind of the central SaaS manage, based management model, which is what we pioneered, like you said, we were ahead of the game at that time, is becoming sort of the most obvious choice now. Now you look back at your role at Stanford, distributed systems, again, they have world-class program there, neural networks, you name it. It's, it's really, really awesome. As well as Cal Berkeley, there was in, in debates with each other, who's better, but we'll, that's a separate interview. The, now you got the edge, what are some of the distributed computing challenges right now uh, with now the distributed edge coming online, industrial, 5G, data? What do you see as some of the key areas to solve from a problem statement standpoint with edge and as cloud goes on premises, data center to essentially data center at the edge, apps coming over the top, AI enabled. What's your, what's your uh, take on that? Yeah, so I think so. There's and there's different flavors of edge, and the one that we we focus on is you know what we call thick edge, which is you have this problem of managing thousands of as we call micro data centers rather than managing maybe few tens or hundreds of large data centers, where the problem just completely shifts on its head, right? And I think it is still a an unsolved problem today, where whether you are a retailer or a telecommunications vendor, et cetera, managing your footprints of tens of thousands of stores as a retailer is a very is solved in a very archaic way today because 
the tool set, the traditional management tooling that's designed to manage, let's say your data centers is not quite, you know, it gets retrofitted to manage these environments and it's 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 kind of, you know, square peg and round, you know, round hole kind of situation. So I think the topmost challenges are being able to manage this large footprint of micro data centers in the most effective way right where you have latency solved you have the issue of a small footprint of resources at thousands of locations and how do you fit in your containerized or virtualized or other workloads in the most effective way to have that solved um you know you need to have the uh, the security aspects around these environments so there's a number of challenges that kind of go hand in hand like what is the most effective storage which you know can still be deployed in that compact environment um, and then cost becomes, you know, a related. Costs point. are huge because you have data. If you move data, you're going to have costs. If you move compute, it's not as much. If you have an right. operating system concept, is the data in state or stateless? These are huge problems. This is an operating system, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's an it's a distributed operating system, and where it's multiple layers or you know uh, of ways of solving that problem just in the context of data like you said uh, you know having an intermediate caching layer so that you know you still do just in time processing at those edge locations and then send some data back uh, and that's where you can incorporate some you know ai or other technologies etc so it's you know just data itself is a multi layer problem there well it's great to have you on this program advice final question for you for the folks watching um, technical um, degrees. Most people are finding out in elementary school and middle school a lot more robotics programs, a lot more tech exposure, you know, not just in Silicon Valley, but all around, you're starting to see that. What's your advice for young girls and people who are getting either coming into the workforce reskilled as they get enter, it's easy to enter now, as they stay in and, and how do they stay in? What's your advice? Yeah, so you know, I think it's the same goal. I have two little daughters, and I, it's the same principle I try to follow with them, which is I I want to give them as much exposure as possible without me having any predefined ideas about what and what you know they should pursue. But it's that I think that exposure that you need to find for yourself one way or the other because you really never know. Like you know, my husband landed into computer science through a very very meandering path, and then he discovered later in his career that it's the absolute calling for him. It's something he's very very good at right but so uh, you know uh, it, it's it's the you know the reason why he thinks he didn't pick that path early is because he didn't quite have that exposure so it's that exposure to various things even things you think that you may not be interested in is the most important aspect and then things just naturally lend themselves find your calling superpower strengths know what you don't want to do <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Network, great advice. Thank you so much for coming on and contributing to our program for International Women's Day. Great to see you in this context. We'll see you on theCUBE. We'll talk more about Platform 9 when we go to KubeCon or some other time, but thank you for sharing your personal perspective and experiences for our audience. Thank you. Fantastic, thanks for having me, John. Always this, great to chat. This is theCUBE's coverage of International Women's Day. I'm John Furrier. We're talking to the leaders in the industry from developers to the boardroom and everything in between and getting the stories out there, making an impact. Thanks for watching.